Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter. We begin with verse 31. Jesus is still sitting atop the Mount of Olives with his disciples, and he's talking about the end of time and the great harvest of souls, talking about who is in the kingdom and who is not. And why? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? The king will answer them, truly, I tell you, Just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are the very difficult words of God for the people of God. Will you join me in the prayer of Richard of Chichester? Thanks be to thee, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits thou hast given me for all the pains and insults thou hast borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly day by day. Amen. Years ago, my favorite computer game centered on the adventures of Robin Hood In addition to being a beautiful game, the art, the graphics were amazing. It was loaded with tests and challenges that allowed me to feel immersed into the mythos of Robin Hood. While stealing from the rich and being a general pain to the sheriff of Nottingham, as a player, I encountered different people along the way, including a beggar, a damsel in distress, a nun, and an elderly woman that the game referred to as a crone. By the way, don't ever refer to a lady as a crone. <laughs> you could respond to each of these, rather, these random characters in a variety of ways. For example, you could help them out. You could send them on their way. You could ignore them. You could insult them. You could even shoot arrows at them. But at the end of the game, King Richard returns from the Crusades and Robin Hood is brought before him accused of being a thief, 
a robber, a threat to the king, a general menace. Robin Hood must defend himself. And that's when the beggar, the damsel in distress, the nun, and the crone reappear, or witnesses to their deaths appear. They stand before King Richard and testify as to how you treated them in the game. Their testimony determines whether or not you emerge from the game as Sir Robin, champion of the poor, or you're sent to the gallows as just another criminal who oppressed the poor as well as stole from the king. I thought the game was delightful in the 90s, and I wish it was still on the market because I think it teaches even the secular world valuable life lessons. It matters how you treat people, especially people who appear to be unable to do anything for you. People who may even come up to you off the street and ask for help. People whom Jesus referred to as the least of these those who've really given their lives over to Jesus, who really love him and get him, love the people he loved, they serve the people he served. In fact, if churches are looking for a mission that's in line with Jesus' vision, this is part one of that. The second part comes at the end when we're sent out to make disciples of all nations. Of course, when Jesus presented this to his disciples, he was just following in his heavenly father's footsteps. You read the Hebrew scriptures, you know that God has a special place in God's heart for the poor and the foreigner. The alien in your midst is what God sometimes refers to him as. In fact, one of the ways God underscored how important it was for God's people to care for the foreigner was to remind them how they were once foreigners, strangers in a strange land, and how they relied on the hospitality of their hosts. As I look out across this congregation, there's probably nobody here who doesn't have some ancestor who came to America looking for a better life. My great, 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 maybe one more great in there, grandfather came to Texas in the 1840s from Poland, arrived in New York, fell sick, was taken care of by Christians. My great, great, great grandfather was Jewish. He was going to teach English. But his pronunciation was so bad, they said, you know, you really need to listen to some good orators. And so they encouraged him to go to the churches and listen to the preachers. And he not only learned English, he learned about Christianity and he converted. And then he fell sick and the church took care of him. When I think about people who immigrate to our country, I remember my great, great, great grandfather and how people took him in. A couple of weeks ago, I heard a woman in a radio interview talking about her fear of foreigners in our country. She said, the good people don't leave their home countries and come to America. It's just the bad ones. And what made her statement ironic was that she had been introduced as a person who had immigrated to America from Britain in the 1960s. Was she making some kind of self-confession? Scripture is clear. God's people were to provide for the poor and the foreigner in their land. Grape owners and farmers were told not to harvest all their land. Don't go from fence post to fence post. Leave some of that stuff behind. And that way the poor could come and glean for it. And you remember that man, Boaz, who provided for the poor and the alien? Remember that woman named Ruth, that Moabite woman, that foreigner who came along and benefited from his practice? Boaz later made her his wife, and she became the grandmother of King David. Scripture is clear. You weren't to turn anybody away. 
When you live in the desert, hospitality can be the difference between living and dying. A drink of water can be the difference. God says in Scripture, you shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not abuse any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry. My wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children orphans. When Israel went into captivity on two different occasions, the prophets referred back to this and said, this is what God said would happen. God took the provision of the poor and the foreigners seriously. Just as there were severe, severe punishments for those who choose to ignore the poor, there were also blessings for those who showed them compassion. The psalmist writes in Psalm 41, Happy are those who consider the poor. The Lord delivers them in the day of trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. They are called happy in the land. You do not give them up to the will of their enemies. The Lord sustains them on their sick beds. In their illnesses, you heal all their infirmities. The author of Proverbs writes, those who despise their neighbors are sinners, but happy, blessed are those who are kind to the poor. Prophet Isaiah, speaking for God, offers a word of judgment to those who make life harder on the poor. Ah, you who make iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be your spoil and then you may make the orphans your prey. What will you do on the day of punishment in the calamity that will come from far away? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your wealth so as not to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain? For all this, his anger has not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. In a disciple Bible study class at another church, we were reading through the Hebrew prophets and the New Testament books of Luke and Acts. And on the last day of the class, I asked the group, what's your overall impression about what we've read? And one of the people said, it's all about the poor. And he was right. When you read the prophets, a lot of their harsh judgments come because they believe the leaders of the nation and the people not only forgot the poor, but added to their burdens. When we get to the Gospels, we see Jesus' concern for the poor was something that he inherited from his heavenly father. His first sermon recorded in Luke 4 centered on the poor. His text came right out of Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That year of the Lord's favor refers to the year of Jubilee, something that was supposed to have happened in Israel every 50 years when all debts were canceled and all property held in trust or as collateral or confiscated to repay debts was returned to its original owners. In Luke, rather than invite the rich and powerful to their dinner parties, Jesus encouraged his followers to invite the poor, the infirm, the blind, promising those who did so eternal life in heaven. If you want to be with me, he says, you take them in. He tells his disciples at one point, give to all who ask. Think about that. No caveats, no instructions, don't ask for IDs, no background checks, just give. One of my favorite radio comedians was Fred Allen. Fred Allen lived in New York City, which may have hampered his career in some ways. But Allen refused to move to California, saying once that California was a great place to live if you were an orange. 
Fred Allen, like so many other radio and early television comedians, grew up in vaudeville. And he never forgot his roots, nor the people he performed with as he rose to stardom. A lot of those folks didn't make it. Their acts were not something that could go national. But Fred was always generous. And he sent many of them money, and he gave them cash whenever they appeared backstage at one of his shows. And as a faithful Catholic, he took seriously the injunction to help the poor, and he walked most of the time in New York City. And he carried two money clips with him. One money clip was for food, and haircuts, other incidentals. But the other money clip was money to give away whenever someone came up to him. I've always thought that was such a wise thing to do. He was always prepared to give, and he had determined the amount in advance and was always ready. I think a lot of time we're not ready when someone comes up to us. We're caught off guard. I know a lady from another church who always packed an extra Lunchable with her when she went to work just in case she got stopped at a light where there was a person regularly holding up a sign, we'll work for food. She felt it was her Christian duty to respond and to be prepared. And if that person chose not to take the meal, well, that was on them. She had done what she could. Richard of Chichester, that man who gave us that beautiful prayer we pray each week, took Jesus' call to the give to those in need to heart, when told that his planned offerings for the poor exceeded his cash on hand, he said, sell the gold and silver plate and sell my horse to make up the difference. Christians take Jesus's words seriously because Jesus self-identifies with the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely. He even claims them as his own family. Just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. In this and in every statement Jesus ever made about the poor, he leaves us with only one option, and it's not to judge them. It's to give. Now, one of the interesting things I find about this parable is how both the sheep and the goats respond to the king when he speaks of being hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, in prison. Both groups say, when did we ever see you like that? The folks who acted with compassion had no idea that what they did for the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely, they were doing for Jesus. This Sunday marks the end of the Christian year. Next week, with Advent, we begin a new year uh, and a new gospel. And in praying the text for this week, I was invited to envision the last year and the opportunities I had to be a sheep. I had to feed Jesus, to give him a drink of water, to welcome him with gracious hospitality, to clothe him, to visit him, to ride him, to seek him out. Can you see a face? I was asked to think about times when I may not have responded, when I was more of a goat than a sheep. Was there someone that you avoided? an opportunity to be the face of Christ that you let slip away? How does that feel? What would you do differently? As I meditated on that, I started to see faces. On the other hand, can you see other faces? People that you did reach out to and help somebody you did feed, someone you clothed, someone whose life you made a huge difference in. How was that experience for you? 
Did you see the face of Christ in them? Think about this. Imagine that when you help them, they saw the face of Christ in you. We can't go back and undo the past. But Jesus was spot on when he said that the poor will always be with us. There will be other opportunities. Other times he will come to us in disguise. How can we be ready? How can we be welcoming? Susan White, a British Methodist who taught worship at Bright Divinity School, told me about working with a church that was building a new sanctuary. She said they were having a really difficult time deciding where they were going to put the baptistry. Should it be up here on the chancellor? Should it be on the floor? Should it be on the right side or the left side? I mean, the people were getting into some serious arguments about this. And finally, with a little frustration, Susan said, well, why don't you just put it at the front of the door? And they said, well, if we did that, then every time somebody came in, they would pass by the baptistry. Every time they came in, they would pass by the baptistry and remember their baptism. Every time they came in, they wound up putting the baptistry at the front door. And the argument stopped. When I Googled pictures for the PowerPoint, are, are we with PowerPoint or are we sick? <laughs> One of the images that kept popping up was this one. <laughs> it's called Homeless Jesus. And it's by sculptor, sculptor Timothy Schmaltz. I apologize for the size. This is going to be in our art and faith class today. It's a homeless person sleeping on a bench. But when you look closer, you see that the bare feet have nail prints in them. And I found that it started, first of all, it was placed outside Regis College in Toronto. But what amazed me was when I Googled the name of the sculpture, I found that now scores of other churches from all around the world have commissioned their own version of Homeless Jesus. They're in Glasgow, Scotland, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Baltimore, Maryland, Capernaum, Israel, Barcelona, Spain, Dublin, Ireland. And like I said, most of them are outside churches. They're on sidewalks. This one is by a bus stop near Mockingbird Lane in Elmbrook in Dallas. And, and I thought as I looked at that, why would a church do that? To put that out on the front? That's just encouraging homeless people to come to their church. And like those folks in that congregation with Susan White, I got to thinking, it's like throwing open the doors of their church to the least, the last, the lost, the lonely, throwing out the welcome mat to the homeless. Those words stop me in my tracks. And then these words of Jesus came back. Truly, I tell you that just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Amen. <laughs>